Hi, good morning to all of you, um, or good afternoon if you're calling in from the US. Um, today, we are, have um, Dave Ulrich with me um, on the Serene View. So the Serene View, as those of you who know, um, is a session all about conscious business. And today, we are very, very lucky to have Dave Ulrich, um, professor at the University of Michigan, um, as well as um, an author of over 30 books, 200 articles, I think, and counting. Um, and also, he's consulted with over half of all Fortune 200 companies, and he's been a keynote speaker in 90 countries. So today, um, I'm very privileged to have you, Dave. Um, thank you very much for joining the show this morning. And Green, Thank you. It is a privilege to be here. Thank you. And I welcome you to my office. You know, in the world we live in, we've all been technologically distant in Singapore or the U.S. or wherever we are. And yet it allows us to peek into people's offices. I get to see behind you a beautiful vase, and you see behind me some books and pictures of things that matter to me. So welcome to my office, and what a privilege to have a conversation with you this morning or today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, today we are talking about workplace mental health. Um, for those of us who have been working in the last year, that is not a, not an unusual thing at all. Uh, in fact, statistics show that um, for something like 92% of people here in Singapore, and actually 83% in the US, um, they are experiencing work-related stress of some kind. 25% cited as their number one source of stress. And 40% talk about how it's extremely stressful um, to be working. So, I mean, when you think about it, why do you think, I mean, why do you think that working in organizations is causing us so much issues with our mental health? You know, mental health is a big issue. My wife is a psychologist and uh, we have a daughter who's a psychologist. And what happens is the expectations on us are very high. And so when we get out of our comfort zone, people expect new things of us. And so in an organization where there's pressure to perform and the expectations are high, and we're out of our comfort zone, we feel a mental health problem. Sometimes that's depression. And depression generally looks backward. I'm depressed because of my past, because of my history, or it may be anxiety, which looks forward. I have anxiety because I can't predict the future. Well, in an organization where we spend an enormous amount of our time with people, often people we didn't choose to be with. I mean, the members of our organization could be colleagues and associates that we didn't pick. We feel stress. What's amazing is we also feel stress even in families where I hope we got to pick our spouse uh, or even worse, we feel stress with our children uh, sometimes because they act like us. And, uh, and so I think mental health is an inevitable challenge in the world we live in. In the last year, it's become worse. No question. Uh, the pandemic has changed our routines. Um, we love patterns. The, the research says about 65 to 75 percent of what we do is patterns. We get up in the morning, we go through a pattern, we go to work, we come home, we have dinner, we have a pattern. Those patterns are all broken. There is no more pattern at all. And so our job, I think, is to, is to cope with that newness that we didn't have before. And do you think that, I mean, whose responsibility is it that we are, you know, not having good mental health? Do you think that we should be, you know, looking at governments to do it? organizations uh, do you think that it's you know, our own responsibility or that of our immediate superior or even hr you know whose job is this yeah the answer is yes uh <laughs> i mean government sets policy that allows us in singapore government has been incredibly helpful in managing the pandemic and allocating resources from your capital funds government sets policy organizations can become a setting for good or bad I've, uh, I think all of us have been in an organization that was stressful uh, because of the demands, because of the people. Uh, our boss can be good or bad. I bet every one of us can say, oh, I had a good boss or, oh, I had a bad boss. I think ultimately the choice on mental health is our own. Uh, somebody else can set the setting or the context, but it becomes our stewardship and our responsibility to be agents to ourselves. How am I going to respond? In the same setting, two people can respond very differently. One person can respond with optimism and discover what could be. The other can respond with discouragement and anxiety. 
and look at what's wrong. And so ultimately, I think mental health is an internal factor. Again, it is very complicated. My wife is a very good psychologist and the prediction of what leads to mental health is so complex. It's heritage, it's history, it's status, it's, it's your own experience, it's your expectations. But the workplace is a critical place for mental health. And in an organization where there's positive mental health and people are engaged and, in, and excited and having great well-being, those are the organizations that over time are much more successful. Do, do you think that there is going to be this kind of organizations? Um, because one of the things we talked about um, is organizational drag, right? Um, the sure sort of paperwork, stuff that we need to do that you know is not productive, is not getting anywhere, but we have got to do it because we work in a company. Um, I mean, is it will, will it will there ever be a day when exactly like you say we go to work and we are productive and we are thriving at work? Uh, will there ever be a day when it's perfect? No. Will I ever be the perfect weight? No. Um, but I see organizations getting better. By the way, the key to their getting better is they bring you in, Serene, as their consultant. And then after you do their consulting, they are much better. That was a joke for you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, so. I, 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 I think there are organizations that improve. And you are so right. The concept of drag. I remember we've been we've worked with a number of companies where they have the burden of bureaucracy is so huge that you feel like all I do is spend my time going through things. So what we love to do in companies, and I hope people that are listening do it in their own company. What is the drag? I'll tell you what it is. Reports that I fill out. Approvals meetings, measures, policies, practices. We call it ramp, reports, approvals, meetings, measures, policies, practices. We love to go into a company and say, what are the reports? What are the approvals? What are the meetings? What are the measures? What are the policies? What are the practices that aren't adding any value to anybody? You do a report, nobody uses it. You do an approval, nobody matter, it doesn't matter. You go to a meeting, nobody cares. Once you identify that stuff, you really can kill it. And we've done a number of uh, interventions in companies where we've said, uh, get a group of 10 people together, engineers, marketing, human resources. What are the reports, approvals, meetings, measures, policies, procedures that make your life miserable? And we have them put them. I, this is a really high tech solution. We put them on little <laughs> sticky notes and we post them on the wall. And then the business and then the group says, what of those can we get rid of? Do we have to turn in that report? We found in one company that one third of the reports that were turned in, one third, nobody read. Well, if nobody's reading the report, quit turning it in. Approvals. We found that if you have more than like six or seven approvals, the early people sign the approval because they know there's a senior boss who's much more senior. Well, by the time seven people have signed it, the eighth person, the senior boss goes, those seven people have signed it. I'm just going to sign it. So we put a new rule in place, no more than three approvals on any allocation. And you better pay attention. I mean, meetings. It's so fun to say, we're going to start a council and it's got a sunset. It's going to end. Pick a date. Uh, January 31st, this meeting will never meet again. And then February 1st you, or February 15th, you can start it over. So you can reconstitute, but you've got to have a day. Anyway, those kinds of things. Uh, I think are, are really helpful to get rid of that drag or that bureaucracy. But I, I don't know. I mean, I have sat in countless meetings where all I did was doddle my thumb and uh, shook my leg uh, and doodle on my pad. Uh, no, when you say get rid of the meetings, right, there is a lot of, I guess, insecurity about the whole issue. I mean, uh, if I get rid of this meeting, what's going to happen? And you know, people won't be informed and so on. You know, how do you deal okay. with all of that? Well, I, I mean, once somebody says, what, you know, it's a very good question to say to somebody, uh, two questions. Let's, let's make this up real time. On a scale of zero to 10, how are you feeling about your experience at work, your engagement, whatever, whatever metric you use, your, your commitment, your engagement, your experience? You can create a new word if you want and write a book, but it's, it's all the same kind of stuff. Seven, Why? What could you do to go from seven to nine? You may never get to 10. I spend too much of my time in bureaucracy. Well, what does that mean? I'm spending my time in meetings, what you just said. Let's help you. 
are there some meetings that could be done less often instead of meeting once a month let's meet or once a week let's meet once every two weeks are there ways to manage the meeting better let's have an agenda i love to focus meetings by the way on uh uh, on results and outcomes, not just dialogue. Um, what can we, let's have a meeting. I love one, one executive said, I'm going to have a meeting when nobody can sit down. So after about 15 minutes, the decisions get faster and faster and faster. Um, <laughs> and so I think there's ways, once you identify what's, what's getting in your way, you can begin to, to manage some of those. And I hope that's what, I hope that's what HR people can help happen. Sometimes HR people create the policies rather than get rid of the policies. And I hope in HR, I'll give you one example that's very common today. Performance appraisal. Almost nobody loves performance appraisal. You don't like it as a child. You don't like it as a student. You don't like it as an adult. Uh, I've been married for 45 years and my wife still gives me performance appraisal. Uh, but, but, you know, you got to have them. You got to have them. Because you got to get comments on how you're doing, and uh, and so instead of creating a complicated form, and sometimes they have, HR builds a whole form in a process. The trend today in performance appraisal is let's teach you how to have a conversation. So if I'm if you're my supervisor, Serene comes to me, Dave, and says, Dave, let's have a conversation, and and I actually love to coach business leaders to say let's make a positive, three things. Dave, help me understand. Help me understand. Your quality of work is going down. You're coming in late to work. Your, your morale seems worse. Here's the data. Help me understand the data. Number one, help me understand. Number two, the data, your quality, your productivity. And number three, so that we can fix the problem. So let's have a conversation. When HR can do that and make sure that that conversation is positive, then I think we move forward. I, I coached a business here. I'll give an example. I'm talking too much here, but I love this conversation. One of the tests of a good leader, do people leave their interaction with you feeling better or worse about themselves? What a simple test. And a leader said to me, well, how do I do that if I've got to give an employee negative feedback? They're not performing well. And I said, I don't know. That's your problem. No, that's not what I said. <laughs> So I, uh, I coached this leader and she ended up having to let somebody go. I know that's not common in Singapore, but there are times when somebody needs to be let go. I knew the employee who was going to be let go and I was really worried. Can he leave that meeting with her, his boss, feeling better about himself? And I was all nervous. I was all nervous and nervous and nervous. Is this going to work? The employee called me and he said, Dave, I just met with my boss. And I said, how do you feel? Because I knew what was happening. He didn't know. He said, I feel really good. And I thought, oh, oh wow. how did that happen? Whoa. Here's what happened. He went into the meeting. The boss looked at him and said, I really care about you. I've been thinking about you. You've been on my mind. I care about you. I care about your family. I care that you get work that will help you fulfill your potential. You have a whole lot of gifts. You have a whole lot of talent. And I'm really worried that what I've done as your boss is put you in a job that is not letting you use those talents. You don't seem happy. The work isn't going as well as you'd like. Would you be willing to work with me to find a place where you could work so that your talents would be better used? And he said, what would that mean? She said, it may be at our company. And if it is, that's great. But it's likely to be elsewhere. And I will do everything I can to make that a good experience. You know, and he said, I left. I knew I was going to leave the company. And you know what's interesting? She went out of her way to find a referral for him in a place where his skills would be good. About a month later, he called me and he said, Dave, I've got another job in this company. The, 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 the president, the head who uh, talked to me, she helped me and she gave me a great referral. And I thought, oh, is she a great leader? She is wow. a great leader because she's, that's a hard conversation. I'll give you one other example. And I know you're getting questions and I'll shut up. Um, I, I'm coaching a leader who is really good, big company, well-known company, but he's tough. He's tough. He's tough. He's tough. He's tough. Somebody about uh, three weeks ago made a mistake in the accounting area, and it was going to cost the company millions of dollars. 
he had written an email to the employee. You made a mistake. It's going to cost us millions of dollars. And he was quite harsh with that employee. And he said, Dave, you've made a commitment that before I send that email, I have to work with you. And I said, thank you. Change the email. In front of that statement that's harsh, so here's the harsh statement, write the following words. I think you have great potential in the company. I want to teach you what you need to do to be better and realize your potential. You made a mistake that cost us millions of dollars. Let's work together to learn from that mistake to help you get better. You know what? That's pretty cool. So in front of the critique, you made a mistake that cost us millions of dollars. He said, I care about you. You have great potential. And you made a mistake. You can't walk away from that. That's real. But the employee said, and, and, and the leader I'm coaching said, wow, I got a call back the next day after I sent that memo. And the employee said, thank you. And I said, be real. You made a mistake. And he said, I know I made a mistake, but you're helping me. So that's the kind of direction I sure hope we can make happen in companies today. I mean, I definitely see that as, you know, something that we hope to see as well. But do you think that's the job of HR or is that job of the line leader? Because oh. I don't know how oh. much influence HR has on this. Well, man. the answer, I think, is yes. But I, I, I've been a professor at the university. When I was teaching uh, MBA students, I had a favorite final exam question. This is my favorite question, multiple choice. Who is primarily accountable and responsible for the people issues in a company? A, the line manager. B, the head of HR. Number three, C, it's shared. D, I don't care, I'm going into consulting. And F, um, the consultant. I don't care, I'm going into finance. And F, the consultant. Or D, the consultant. So, And everybody would write three, it's shared. And I marked it wrong. I think the primarily accountable person for people management in a company is A, the line manager. If you're in HR, our job is to be their coach, their architect, their facilitator, to hold up a mirror and say to this leader I was coaching, you scold people, it's not going to get what you want. Build people so that you're more successful. And so I believe the line manager is the, primarily, the person primarily accountable. But so if, I mean, if this comes true, do you think that workplaces can actually be transformed into sources of, you know, mental wellness? Because right now they are sources of mental ill health. Can, is it possible that they will become, you know, contributors instead? You know, have you ever worked with a colleague, maybe uh, you formed a small business and you have a partner and there's three or four of you and it just feels, by, by the way, relationships are never without problems. I think naive relationships always are difficult. Um, we've been married 45 years. We still end up having to talk. So I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable that relationships are difficult, but I think there are times at, at the university, I've worked for many years in a program where I teach with two dear colleagues, Wayne Brockbank and Dick Beatty. We're friends. We care about each other. Um, and, and I get emotional because it just is fun to work with people I know and care about. So what we, yes, I think a workplace can be good. I, and, and by the way, I love to synthesize complex things. I think there's three things HR and business leaders should look at in a workplace that you try to build into a good workplace, that builds the experience or the engagement. One is believe, meaning, purpose. We have found in our research that a company that has a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, people feel better about the work. I'm not just here to make something. I'm here to have a purpose. Uh, Facebook is not just here to have a technology. They're here to bring people together. Google is not just sharing information. They're trying to provide information, purpose, believe. Become. An organization is a great place to grow and belong. Believe, become, and belong. If you can build as an HR person, those three user experiences in a company, as I go to work, I believe in what we're doing. I become better. I learn, I grow and I belong. I'm part of a group that I enjoy working with. Those organizations have a higher uh, emotional response, sentiment. What's really cool is that that employee attitude is often a lead indicator of customer attitude. 
So when the employees have a better experience, a customer has a better experience and that then leads to a better employee experience. I think we've all been in a store where the employees are grouchy. I bet if I ask, even in Singapore, somewhere on Orchard Avenue, you could, I shouldn't say this. I've been on Orchard Avenue. I go into some stores. I shouldn't say this because I'm going to get in trouble. Sometimes they're a little snotty. Uh, not very often, but sometimes they don't have service in mind. How do I feel? I don't feel good. I don't come back. On the other hand, I've been in those stores in Orchard Avenue where they come and say, welcome to our store. We're not here to force you to buy a product. We're here to have a good experience. How can we be helpful? Those employees who have a good experience will help their customers have a better experience. The statistics bear it out. The correlation between employee experience and customer experience is 0.6 to 0.8. So there's a high relationship. Wow. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know how doable this is. For your information, we bought them the last engagement survey of the entire world. Asia was like the lowest um, in terms of region. And Singapore was the lowest of the lowest of every country. Well, I, I, I mean, every country has a culture. Every country has a culture. Uh, Bhutan, they're the happiest comp company in the world. They see what's right. That's just their DNA. Um, by the way, I sometimes wish I'd been born in Bhutan so that I always see what's right. I think sometimes in Asia, I've done quite a bit of work in Japan. I've had the privilege of being in Singapore. I think it's just some of the culture is don't focus on what's working. Focus on what needs to be improved. And so I think you almost have to look at an engagement survey as a benchmark. And then are we getting better or worse? And don't compare ourselves as much with other countries. Well, I mean, we've talked so much about workplace health and so forth. Um, if I am an individual leader, I mean, I don't control the entire organization. What can I do? I mean, I see my people are not doing well at work. Um, what can I do for them? You know, I feel this really strongly. Um, in the world, in the, a year ago this week or so in March, the world changed, the pandemic hit. And so we've all been isolated. I'm in my office. Many of you are watching this in your home office. I think when we do come back together, and we will, I understand Singapore now, the restaurants, you can come back together. I hope leaders don't start with the job. Here's our task. Here's our goal. I think leaders need to be the emotional first line, and they need to show empathy. I think the first question when we come back is, how are you? How are you? What's happened? I know that often caregivers, mothers or fathers who have children at home, it's really tough to have a child at home and try to work and school. And, and I think leaders need to start by being what I call a soft cushion. How are you? What have you experienced? What have you learned? And I hope leaders become the emotional front line. I, I think in HR, hopefully HR people are the primary caregivers. I mean, we are caregivers of the employee mental health. And I think we're going to see leaders who do that and do that well, really help their employees return to work in a positive way. I hope that's where we go. I think leadership becomes about creating meaning, believe, become and belong, creating meaning, becoming better and feeling part of a team that cares for each other. And we still have to get results. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not ashamed of that. But I, I think good leaders will start to do that more often. But I think when I broach this topic with a lot of the leaders, the response is often that I am also overwhelmed. As in, I, the leader, am also facing, you know, overwhelm, confusion, mental, emotional exhaustion. I think emotional exhaustion is like 54%. And so when I am that stretched out, when, what capacity do I have? to support Definitely. these people who are under me. You know, and I think sometimes we love to hide that. I'm going to be really honest. I don't know anyone privately who hasn't been stressed in the last year. We're out of our comfort zone. I mean, we're, I, I, I travel. I travel to Singapore a lot. Uh, and I've traveled a lot. I haven't traveled for a year. Not, it, not at all. I'm out of my comfort zone. And so I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling anxious, and little things that may be a small issue become a bigger issue. I hope as leaders we can, we can share some of that. Yeah, I have a story. Let me share my story. I got frustrated at something that I shouldn't have been so frustrated with. And it could show up with our spouse, with our partner, it could show up with our children. Oh, I got more angry with my daughter or my son than I probably should have. 
and I go back and say, I'm really sorry. I'm aware of my anxiety and my stress. Let's try to learn to, to share so that we can go forward. One of the things my wife teaches me in psychology, when I understand the underlying cause of an issue, for example, I probably don't want to do this one. Uh, my father died and I have a, my father is in this sorry. picture. I'm sorry for that. Uh, well, he died about eight or nine years ago. He died early in April. Once in a while, when April comes around, I'm kind of depressed. I'm kind of feeling bad. I'm kind of edgy. And my wife said, do you realize that's when your dad died? You know what? I miss my dad. Once I understand what's behind that anxiety or that stress, I think then I can better cope with it. Yeah, I do miss my dad. And that's okay. Um, and I think sometimes when leaders can be self-revelatory and share their experience, share their story, the employees will share theirs. And it brings us closer together. I bet you've had a stress. I bet you've got a story as well. Yeah. That the but last year has been hard. It is. But I was going to say, is it okay for the leader to say that? I mean, obviously, I mean, something like grief, that's very deeply personal. And I'm sorry for your loss. But if it's something about, oh, I'm very overwhelmed at work. Uh, I know I am uh, confused and I don't know what to do. As a leader, I will be so concerned that uh, you know, there's a line. You don't want to you don't want to lose confidence of your people, but you can you can make a joke on a score of zero to ten. How many have felt stressed in the last month? Raise your hand. And everybody, how stressed? Everybody goes ten. He goes, "Whoa, somebody's an eight. What have you done to not be stressed?" I mean, I think humor and I, no, I don't think the leader goes in and self reveals. We've had a leader in a country who never admitted a mistake. He always said, I never apologize. I never, you may have a hypothetical who that leader might be. Uh, <laughs> he never admits a mistake. He's always right. You know what? That's horrible. Look, I made a mistake. I learned from it. Join me. Let's move on. Now, I don't think you dwell on the mistake. I think you focus on the future. And I don't think leaders have to, re I, leaders shouldn't do public therapy. I've, I've had leaders try to do that and say, oh, I really need your help. And you're going, look, you're a leader. Stand up take on and but but also be empathetic and you know leadership is more of an art than a science um uh, i i find sometimes when i when i make fun of myself or when i have fun i'll show it something that's fun this is my father i was talking about it my kids oh. made this book and my father was weird and so this is wow. a book i could read to my grandchildren about my father and and i go yeah i behave this is a picture in the back of my room my dad picked up groceries every day after he retired at a store and delivered them to the needy, the homeless. So wow. he, did, uh, he did that for 20 years after he retired. Wow. And I can make fun. I mean, you know, that's not a very flat. Well, that's my that's my father. And now that's me most days when I'm tired because I sit in right. a chair and sleep. But a leader's got to have fun. You got to create vitality. You got to you got to have inspiration. And I hope good leaders do that. I hope they do that. Well, look, I really appreciate this half an hour with you. I think we've learned so much. You've given us so much uh, just in half an hour. And before we leave, is there any like last words that you want to leave? I with am going to do something that's going to be fun and serene. You yes. know Singapore. You've lived there. You've gone to school there. What's one thing that a, someone in Singapore could do that would help improve mental health at companies? What's one thing people listening could do in Singapore it would improve mental health? Well, I think if it's one thing, um, I would say I pick what um, you said. Uh, I think, okay, so a lot of people think Singaporeans are very serious, but I think we have a very wicked sense of humor. Um, uh -huh. And a wicked sense of humor. And I think having the ability to connect on that level um, to kind of even grouse about something and say, oh, you know, this is not working as well, but to connect um, to the employees I think that's vitally important uh, because I think at the end of the day, what has been happening for this one year is people get on Zoom calls to only solve the problem and all of that human interaction in the office, right? Dropping by to go like, you want to go for lunch or whatever has all gone out. Um, so just even if, if it's just, you know, five minutes before the meeting to just connect and say, hey, how are you? You know, and just crack a joke together, complain about some, you know, mutual uh, grouse. I think that would really help mental health. I think yeah. that is so wise. You know, I think, and I think in joining ourselves, I've got to tell you, I don't know why I'll share this. 
the first time I came to Singapore was probably 15 or 20, 25 years ago. And I go up and down with weight. I mean, I don't need to hide it. It's, it's obvious that I'm up and down. So I was wearing a suit that was a little tight. And a young woman was hosting me and, 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 and making sure I had a good experience. I was in front of 500 people or 300 people giving a talk. At the break, she came up and said, Professor, you have big hole in your pants. <laughs> because I had squatted and I had split out my pants. I was so embarrassed. So I quickly sat down and put a little thing over me. And then I thought, I should share that. So I, I went up to my room, obviously quickly and changed clothes. And I came back down and I said, my first experience in Singapore. And I mooned Singapore. <laughs> I, I, and everybody laughed and somebody noticed and said, uh -oh. you ran into it. You made a joke of it. And you know what? Every, and now I'm telling you the story. So I love Singapore because my first experience is I mooned Singapore. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I hope leaders have a sense of humor about themselves so that they do what you just said. And the Singapore people were so kind. They said, whoa, the professor mooned us. Now, it wasn't bad. I mean, it wasn't that bad, but it was just, you got to have a sense. Of, and I love your laugh. And, and, and I hope we can create that in companies where we live and work. We spend a lot of our time in organizations where we work, where we worship, where we pray at temples or at mosques or at churches. I hope we can have good experiences. That's my passion. That's my passion. Thank you for inviting me. What a Thank wonderful you. opportunity. And Thank I'm not so mooning Singapore ever again. <laughs> oh, I was hoping for a repeat performance on this. No, 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 oh. no, no. I will wear very big pants. I will never move <laughs> Singapore again. Yes, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. And really, thank you for this opportunity really to think about, you know, how workplace health can help us and can also, you know, HR, line leaders, how we can really do something uh, for the people in our organization. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who are still online, um, I am doing this every week uh, for the next 12 weeks. So next week is International Women's Day, and I've invited a senior women leader to share her journey um, going through um, how she has helped her people to be emotionally inclusive. So thank you very much, Dave, once again. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you again. Um, those of you who want to connect with Dave, uh, his, his LinkedIn is Dave Ulrich. So Dave, D-A-V-E, U-L, ultimate. Rich, R I C H. So Dave is ultimately very rich. And so if you want to connect with him, he's on LinkedIn. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank All you. right, so see you next time. Bye bye.